Hello, beautiful people. Welcome to the Occult Explorers. I'm Snappy, and I'm joined by my co-host and good friend, Dion. How you doing, Dion? Hola, hola, hola. So this is going to be a fun episode, but first, we really got to give trigger warnings for this one, because we're going to be getting down into some pretty uh, erotic and sensual territory. So... If that kind of stuff makes you uncomfortable, the talking about sex, the talking about um, female anatomy, female um, sexual and reproductive functions, maybe this is not the episode for you. Uh, what did you find, Dion, and what are we digging into today? Well, let's give a complete trigger warning. Okay. It'll include all people might be offended from um, anti-Semitic, Islamophobia, trans, just the subject can it covers a lot of the stuff that's currently going on that's hot topic right now in the world by digging in the past you know so yeah yeah, also also, i was just gonna say and we want to remind people we're exploring ideas we're exploring real cultural phenomenon that talked about in various books and and talked about in the darker weirder occult places We are not saying that we support or agree with anything here. We're just presenting information for the fun of exploring it, right? Getting all heavy trigger warnings just to talk about the water of life? Yeah. The water of life. Fountain of youth, right? Fountain (laughs) of youth. Um, So today, I'm going to break it down into distillations, like alcohol, you know, when you distill something. And to also also let the people know later on, um, we're going to have the doctor joining us for the second half of the show, Dr. Amon. So we'll make this quick. Um, let's go to the first pick. All right. Here we go. Right there. Drink or die. Water of life. <laughs> pirates. It's about pirates. We'll start with pirates. You know we're into pirates. This of episode, course. it should have pirates and Jesus in um, body fluids if we're doing everything correctly. So... The water of life was considered uh, alcohol back in the day, like your rum, your whiskeys, your wines. Yeah, yeah, because on a on a ship, water is would go bad, and it was alcohol that would you know you could preserve. And so, to pirates, that was considered the alcohol of life. I mean, the alcohol of life, huh? Tons yeah. of life. <laughs> the drink of life. Yeah, so Water's much life. so that uh, next it progressed into aqua vitae in the the middle ages we'll actually hit the next pick i'll show you right here it's the fountain of youth which is connected to the water of life because the pirates used to go looking for that because there was myths that somewhere on the planet they could find this magical fountain that would give them everlasting life and here's one of the representations uh from one of these artists in the renaissance period I, i take it and you might have heard who was it uh Ponce de Leon, I think, was one of them that went looking right. for the the fountain of youth and these different pirates. But eventually, aqua vitae, the water of life, turns into another form of alcohol. If you hit the next pick, which is ethanol, and that's using alchemy. Yes, alchemy. Middle Ages, Dark Ages, Renaissance times. Uh, people figured out that sugar ferments into alcohol. And you could get high off that too. You know, it, ethanol was used originally as a sedative and getting high. It's, it's a strong form of alcohol at that. And it can be extracted from wine. Boiling wine and adding uh, urine salts is one recipe I came across. That was a, um, yeah, that was a Muslim recipe. In I really like this image too because it's almost like the hermetic staff or this, you know, staff of hermes but done with these um uh, alchemy style beakers wild well we might well if you want to unpack the image um colors no, that's, that's the only that al- image i had there yeah hermes yeah, well, well, remember um set and horus when they were battling and they twist that that pole that tree of life to extract something or to churn some butter yeah, we also see that in the Indian, right, where they're taking, where Shiva takes, well, all of the gods and the devas, they take the world snake Vasuki and they churn the ocean of milk with the, the largest mountain in order to produce the uh, the Amritsa, right, the, the, the elixir of life. Yeah, so, 
It's a common theme. Yeah, and, and you can see it in the symbology and some of these paintings, uh, some of the graphics. And like I said, ethanol was used as a sedative. It was used as a fuel source. It was used as a tool. It was used to get you high because it's a very strong alcohol. You know, right. we're talking next level. Um, and when I was talking about urine and putting urine into wine to distill it, to boil it, it deals with sugars and urine. Um, we'll get into that topic as well. Let's hit the next pick. So ants are attracted to some urine if it has sugar in it. And that was a test to see if you had diabetes back in the day. A Greek, uh, from the Greek word uh, coming from, what is it, uh, honey urine? You know, and in ancient you Egypt- You mentioned this where they would taste the urine too, right? The good, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The Urology is one of the first forms of medicine, along with midwifery. Um, even in ancient Sumer and Egypt, urology, what they talked about it in the different texts about the different forms of medicine and in rituals as well. And just recently, I mean, and this is recent, like in June, a couple months ago, they found a vessel in Egypt containing psychoactives. And some of the psychoactives were harmala. If you want to hit the next pick. Oh, um, wow. And it was in a cup of Bess, you know, Bess, we talked, uh, we talked yeah, about that before. This that weird kind of guy. Yeah. yeah, from Egypt. Well, they have a female version, Bess S, and it's very ancient. It's connected to cats as well. But in this cup of Bess, they found Parmela, they found the Blue Lotus, as well as vaginal fluid. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. Getting high off vaginal fluid, my favorite topic. <laughs> Just saying. And so in Egypt, it was one of their favorite topics, too. They had formulas for it. And so if you've watched any of our past 40 episodes, you know, the 40, what's the 40 uh, days to make a mummy or 40 years wandering after 40 mm -hmm. episodes, you should figure out, you know, these body fluids and the and theosexual rituals, which we'll break down more today. And so it's in ancient Egypt, yeah, yeah, they had uh, the water of life. And so there's other uses for, for urine in Egypt as well. Um, for tanning, tanning leather. You know, they, they did it for teeth whitening. In some cities in Greece, they would collect the, the urine and urinals and use that to for teeth whitening. Also wow. to do laundry. They collected it, the urine to do laundry. Well, they used it a lot for processing of wool too, right? To remove the, um, the fats and the oils from the sheep's wool. And from lamb's wool, you know, and they would also use it in the, like we were talking about in a previous episode, the fermentation of beers and meads. Oh, yeah. And urine can be used as a medicine. You can study, there's different videos on YouTube, at least hundreds of them, going into the different forms of urine medicine, urine therapy. You know, we won't break all that down today because I want to get back to vaginal fluids and the healing properties, so much so that now they're making medicines. I came across a new uh, document, one of those pub docs, talking about medicines that are being extracted from vagina fluids and the healing right. properties of the vagina to self-regulate itself with lactic acids through the pH, through different properties. And in Egypt, they knew that. And they worked with acacia. We talked about crocodile dung, honey, different um, herbs that they were processing through the vagina to control. Um, let's hit the next pick. Biotransformation. We've just we've discussed that in different episodes. Uh, one example being a Siberian shaman drinking Amanita muscaria, um, peeing out muscarol as a bioactive substance. This is called biotransformation coming through the kidneys. So let's say our body fluids are special on their own. Just like wine is special on its own, but what kind of wine did you want? A medicated wine, a spiced wine? Do we want a medicated urine, a spiced urine? So in ancient times, uh, they were using the body, male and female, as a processing unit to break down herbs and substances. You know, um, 
And this is something that's still done in a lot of the, the the psychedelic and occult communities where people are doing large amounts of of amnita muscaria or they're taking LSD and then they're drinking their urine in order to get stoned a second time, you know? Yeah. Well, we asked AI for previous episodes um, if cows eat ergotized rye, will their milk contain LSA? Yep. If goats, uh, THC, the doves, crop milk, THC, opioids, um, animals as processing units. But today it's about humans as processing units. This is really a uh, human husbandry. But when we get to that, I'm going to get into midwifery. It, now this is the women's uh, realm because before it was husbandry. So, but it's really evolving out of midwifery, urology, and out of these menstruation and childbirth. The well, basics. Azamin has made clear throughout all of his studies numerous times is that medicine comes out of gynecology largely, and it comes out of the woman's practices. You know, it was a woman's art for the most part of human history. Ah, so let, we'll get deeper into it today. Um, <laughs> Skeen's gland. You might have heard of the magical Skeen's gland for female ejaculation or female squirting which is a phenomena uh, when women have an orgasm, some fluids can come out. Not all women, not in all situations, but when it happens, uh, they call, can call it gushing, ejaculating, uh, squirting. And they've done studies on this to see what the fluid is. And the fluid is mostly urine, processed, transformed, distilled. When the baby is floating in the mother's womb for nine months, what do you think the fluid is? It's composed mainly of urine. Wild. Yeah. You have a liver, a kidney, a bladder. Three separate functions. Your urine secretes hormones. You know, there's all kinds of different therapeutics out there with it, you know, concerning this. So the skeins adds an extra level to that. It processes the urine and adds to it fructose, something, a uh, PSA that has phos uh, phosphorus in it, as well as dealing with the prostate. They call it the female prostate. It has antimicrobials in it, the different chemicals. And so the ancients knew about this. Right. Definitely yeah, anyone with, the, anyone with uh, you know, a woman's um, bodily parts, you know, will be able to do this, basically. And so now the, the skeins, the word skeins, Greek word, um, scath, a scalpel to cut, a skiff, goes through water, parts the waters. The skeins parts the waters and transforms it. Well, in ancient times, the skein is a scene. It's the background of a theater. Let's go to the next pick. Yeah, we were just talking about this uh, the other night on our um, the episode that Graham and I did where we we're talking about Aeschylus. This is where in the theater, people would go to change into costumes and to be transformed, and then they would come back out. Um, really interesting. Oh, yeah. I saw your graphic last night, and it had the stage set up, the amphitheater, the amphibian theater, meaning on each side, water connotations. And the, the scheme was the stage originally, because if we take away the, this amphitheater, you know, that's Pompeii right there. I like that shape. The scheme was originally a tent that could be set up anywhere. And that became the theater, the backdrop, where the actor would transform the, into a god and come out as a god or a goddess. Um, we were reading an interesting article earlier that somebody sent us about the schemes, which we're going to get more into today, in the theater tradition as a female vagina. Yeah. And what was that, that the play with Orestes, Agamemnon, the whole the color of it, how it all breaks down. And so yeah, we, it would always be red, you know, and it would be also connected to uh, this idea of the chaos gap. We have to remember in the earliest Greek uh, myths, life is given birth out of the darkness, out of the womb, the chaos womb, right? Oh, yeah. And so the skeins, different colors, uh, Purple, blue, and red, primary colors. Now, check this out. The poles primarily made of pine. And then the colors they were using, matter, woad, and mollusk. 
all four of those elements are gynecological functions and psychoactive at that. So the tent itself can heal the vagina or get a human high. Traditional wow. uses of the skein's ingredients, besides the symbology behind it. Now, let's hit the next pick. Showed you some of those theaters before where they have water. That, so that, you know, you could, you see what I'm alluding to. And then you got the giant skein or clitoris coming out there at the top. The lighthouse would light up if you did it everything correctly in battle. Amazing. So, we're going to treat this as a the theatrical production because if we erected a skiing house, a scene house, the backdrop for a theatrical production of a Greek stage play, let's do aphrodisia festival. Um, hit the next pick. The characters we call to the stage would be Aphrodite and Patho, if I'm saying her name correctly, which in some versions is her daughter or her, her uh, companion, Hermes' wife. So Hermes likes to steal. She steals a different way, do the art of seduction. Her name means to seduce, seduction, persuasion. That's so yeah. interesting. Because, yeah, we know that Hermes is the is the cattle thief, right? He steals the cows from Helios. And we were talking with Emma, and, like, this is probably women, right? <laughs> well, his wife is involved in a lot of hoo-ha, too. And her, and her sisters deal with... Uh, connotations of urine and they have mirrors that I'm programming you for later. So you'll understand this because there's more this, because this feeds over into other uh, mythologies later on the mirrors and the magic fluids, the ambrosia, the nectars. So here we have uh, Aphrodite, um, Patho, Hermes, wife who steals through seduction, through persuasion. Um, we also have somebody else we would involve, um, invite to the party. But before, let me tell you more about Pytho first, though. Um, they have something called the Whip of Pytho. And the, it's like a whip, but in some people say it's the Jinx, which is a string with the bird at the end, Hecate's will. Oh, wow. But they have a term called the Servants of Pytho, and that would mean prostitutes which they talk about, I think it's Herodotus who gets into that, you know? Um, and so let's invite another person to the stage here of the production. The next pick, please. Hymen, Hymenaeus. So this looks like a bunch of women dressed up dancing around Priapus, the god Priapus. Well, one of them's a man. The one that's touching Priapus' junk is really a man. His name is Hymen. Amazing. The god of marriage in ancient Greece. Um, dressed up as a woman to make offerings to Priapus. You know, I, I want to get a little more into uh, Aphrodite before we click off later. Aphrodite, uh, in some of the myths, the hero has to steal a golden pot of urine from Aphrodite's temple. And in another myth, uh, Cyrene, Cyrene, that's the Libyan king. And another version who finds an herb that makes people fall in love with urine. And because of that, he's transformed into a snake. Interesting. A lot of the same mythologies in, in terms that we've been studying in the other episodes all kind of come together. You know, um, and at the theater there, the Skeen's tent, you would have fumigation and sacrifice. So imagine smoke coming out of it. And some sacrifice, you know, some animals. At this magic Skeen tent, the scene tent, where it all goes down. Um, an ancient ritual. You know, we got to bring somebody else to the stage. I forgot. One more pick, please. Balbo. Ancient goddess. We're getting to some obscure uh, gods and goddesses today. And you notice that her face is down in her stomach where the vagina is. Yeah, where the womb would be. Yeah. Yeah. And if you add an N to her name, Balbo to Balbon, it becomes a dildo in ancient Greece. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. All right. So let's, we're going to go to the next distillation because, and right there. So that, that's one of those mirrors of Aphrodite. 
Just wanted to throw that in. Because well, we're going to talk about mirrors in ancient Hebrew stuff and go to Judah. Um, go to the next image, please. And that's the tabernacle. But the word isn't tabernacle in the original version. It's uh, skinu. Amazing. The skin's tent. That's what it's originally called. Tabernaculum is a Roman word. And they called it the skin's tent. And now these ingredients are a little different in that it has the bowls made of acacia and kermes and mollusk with the colors, which are gynecological as well and get you high as well. So we could take apart the tent and get high. Or it could heal some <laughs> medical issues downstairs. Um, and this is where the Shekinah would go. You know, you heard of the Shekinah? The, it's the, the feminine form of the God, right? Yeah, the spirit, that's where it resides, you know. Um, so now we'll get a, a little wild here. The temple incense that they would burn. Um, Keteret, the magic temple incense. If you look into the formulations of it, the ingredients are also used in gynecological functions. They would take the mollusk and soak it in wine and then mix that with the karchina lye, which is a horse bean. If you want to know what that is, but two different forms of horse beans. Horse beans could either be the schmegma that comes into the horse's foreskin that you collect and use for aphrodisiac purposes, or it could be vetch, which is horse bean, which is also used for gynecological purposes. Or you could use that as an alkaline base to do an AB extraction. That's how you make DMT from like acacia or something. But you could complete that process using the vagina in different steps. Through the bio transformation, or you could put stuff into it, or we can complete the process to initiate when coming together would have maybe the MAOI on an ointment. And so you could see we're using chemistry here in body parts. Um, Mary Magdala. We also she know that for acacia in acacia tears, but but what were you gonna say there? I was just gonna say we also know that they're they're hot boxing these tents with, with tons of uh, myrrh. And like that relates to Ammon's last episode, right? And also tons of, of uh, cannabis. So, <laughs> and probably many other things. So, and burning purple that he talks about. Right. And burning moment. purple being amongst early Christian writers that the Christian cults had purple marks around their mouths and private parts because they were taking part in theosexual rituals. And here I'm getting into the reasons how and why. You know, a woman might have purple in there anyways in ancient times as a form of birth control or for menstruation or different reasons. And if it can get you get your partner high and those same colors are used in um, symbology of royalty, purple and all this stuff. Well, you can see where we're going with it. We also yeah. have the purple anus, too. Right. Like for yeah. those of you who have read Satyricon, maybe go back and take a double look and you'll find a purple anus. <laughs> You know, and so I was going to say Mary Magdala is involved with acacia, acacia groves, acacia tears, you know, um, and these resins. This is this is an ancient science, but it deals with sexual part of it, too. That's where it's the uncomfortable part to people. So you see that little uh, thing in front of the tabernacle there in front of the, the skinu. Yeah, it, that reminds me of the tripod at the Oracle of Delphi. Almost. Well, but that's a basin. A mm. water basin. Well, we'll get more into the story. Um, hit the next pick. You know. Oh, by the way, there's there's a some of that purple mollus, just so you know. And they would take the the stuff out, the ingredients, and it can be used in multiple ways to dye things for royalty. Um, it's used in the private parts, and it's part of sexual rituals. The evidence is out there. So let's hit the next pick. So, all right. That's 1 Samuel 22. Um, there's women that are known to hang out at the tabernacle, at the skinu, in front of it, to, to guard and protect it. Now, other authors talk about these women are prostitutes. They're known to be prostitutes hanging out in front of the tabernacle for different reasons, because they give it to the sons of Eli. They say they seduce them, but the sons of Eli are wicked little boys. One is Phineas, and the other one is Tadpole, so... <laughs> Don't, you can blame it on the women. And they say that the women use mirrors to seduce the men in front of the tabernacle. You know, like I showed you, those mirrors of Aphrodite. 
So much so that they have another chapter in the Bible where they talk about, oh, hit the next pick. They they melt down the women's mirrors. So they go to the women in front of the tabernacle. They grab their mirrors and they melt them down and they turn it into that that uh, brazen laver. You know, the wash, the wash pit you saw it that you saw in front of the tabernacle. Now, the priests had to clean themselves in that magic water before they can go inside the Holy of Holies where the Shekinah was, which originally was mirrors that these women used to seduce men. And they're using that water of life in it to do something to somebody's feet. And we know that washing feet has sexual connotations as well in other chapters. 100%. Oh, man, this is... This is some pretty wild stuff because, like, makes my mind wander to uh, certain uh, places. <laughs> well, we're going we're, we're to start wandering. We're barely getting halfway there. So next pick, please. Mary's well. Because um, I want to get into brides and water and rocks. You know, like, Moses, remember Moses struck the rock and, and the water came out. You know, and the connection between wells. This is a, in Israel, Mary's magic well. Um, They'll say that men meet their brides at wells, including like Jacob meets Rachel. We've talked about Jacob before in other episodes, how he tricks his brother with the red porridge and puts on the suit of Azazel like a goat. And then his wife tricks him with Mandrake because the other sister wants to sleep with him too. And, you know, that other episode. But also Jesus has an a encounter with the Samaritan woman at the well. Like a bridal encounter and it deals with living waters and he she, he wants water from the well and does she want water and he offers her living water because the bridegroom offers living water in the bible is one of the main themes if you went to bible school they would have taught you that about this living waters that the bride gives i mean the bridegroom the bridegroom waters um and there's more to it because there's also a wedding feast in the Bible, there's going to be guests at this big wedding, you know, and, the, and who are, who's his bride? Um, you know, in some of these cultures here, you steal brides. You've heard the custom of stealing brides. Oh, yeah, for sure. Where the were, you know, in, the, in, in modern times, it's the bridegroom's friends. And they come get her the night before or something in the fall, whatever. It's good fun. But in ancient times, they really did that. Hermes would do that. And even in the Bible, they talk about it. Um, well, there's a chapter where uh, the th I'll come in the thief as a thief in the night and the brides disappear you know you've, you've heard that before um, yeah and another thing with these brides it's the bridal yoke animal husbandry to groom a horse the bridegroom has to tame so taming the bride taming the bride is a concept yes so and gross <laughs> culture yeah husbandry so the marriage tradition is based on husbandry and some of these things and stealing you know and, and even the herds with the prostitutes like the the daughters of pytho i talked about before were known as a herd from the sacred grove of aphrodite aphrodite's grove and they were a sacred herd you know and you herd. might want to steal that herd and you might want to steal a bride and you might want to steal um the living waters at that you know, and, and remember, marriages took place under a tent. They would they erect this tent, or they had something in Christian times the the marriage cloth, and it would hold this cloth. So that's that's uh goes back to the skinu. It's still part of the custom, the marriage tent. You know, but interesting. I got. I want to show you one more thing: the sota ritual. Go to the next pick. All right. So in this one. This is called the ritual of bitter waters. For in ancient times, if you thought your wife was cheating on you, you would go to the tabernacle in front of the skinu tent and they would take dust off the ground and put it into the water and she'd be forced to drink the bitter waters. Now, if she was cheating, she would die. But if she wasn't, she would get pregnant. Is she getting pregnant from the tabernacle? Yeah, what they going also on? Because they got different <laughs> brides of Christ that are consecrated to him, like nuns and, and virgins that are consecrated to Christ, stolen and told that you're going to be the bride. You know, 
Oh, yeah. And this is even a theme that we see like in Revelation, right? Where I remember in, when I was in evangelical churches, they would tell me that the bride of Christ or the bridegroom of Christ in Revelation was the church itself. I'm calling BS on that now. <laughs> you know, well, we're talking about that. We're getting into brides more. Um, you know, have you heard of Proverbs 515? There's a saying that deals with water in Wales. You know, these magic waters. And what it says is that you're supposed to drink water from your own sister and drink running waters out of your own well. That's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I like to bring that up because if people talk about the urine therapy and drinking your own urine, it's prescribed in the Bible. Proverbs 5.15. Wild. Just saying. You could go to it. So let's hit the next pick. So... What's this right here? Well, I don't think it's the eye of Sauron. <laughs> yeah, that, that is that is Emmanuel, Jesus in the vagina. Amazing. Where he was punctured on his side by a spear. And it's a symbolic vagina. I have I have heard of this interpretation before. That's interesting. And that fluids come out of it. You know, in some of the versions. Um John 738. It says, uh, out of my belly shall flow rivers of living water. Amazing. I mean, out of his belly. That's why I wanted to show you uh, Bubo before, Bubon, where the God is in the belly. You know, the transformation mm -hmm. is taking place. This is magic fluids. Um, we're going to get more into it before we get almond out here. You know, so... Mark 529. Let's go to the next pick. We talked about this before. Talitha Kun, daughter rise. Uh, where the disciples and Jesus are on a trip somewhere, and a woman has been bleeding for 12 years. And she tries to, to get near him to get healed, and she touches his rope. And he feels all of his power drain out of him. And he, he tells her, What's going on? And she says, Well, you know, I've been bleeding for, for 12 years. Heal me. And then after that, he heals her. Then after that, the, he goes and heals a 12-year-old girl. You remember that story? We've talked about it in different episodes. You might remember. Yeah, and we've, so, we've had this picture before. Yeah. And he, and he uses um, the phrase Talitha Kuhn, daughter rise. He calls her his daughter, um, which is the Aramaic phrase. But, you know, there's more to the story in that. It says that immediately her fountain was healed of the flowing blood. Her her vagina was healed of flowing blood. And the word they use is hege. Hege. You know, I just wanted to bring that up because that word is also in um, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs. Uh, let's see the next pick. You know, there it is, that word hege. You know, I can't read greek but in english it says it's a spring having a seal upon it and in mark that spring is the vagina where he heals the blood coming out of it and wow. here um solomon puts a seal on it and but who he's putting the seal on is his bride as a nymph the word in greek but his sister it says, oh, sister, oh, bride, is part of what he says. A secret spring that no one else uh, can have you. My bubbling fountain hidden from view. The it, always comes back to these weird, it. it always comes back to these weird incest rites. <laughs> There's more to it in that a seal could be a suppository. Interesting. That's where seals work, to break the seal was in ancient times to put the suppository. Um, you know, the peasant. And it has multiple meanings. So, but I want to go to the next pick. All right. The term is anasurma. And that's where she's raising the back of her dress to expose her buttocks. In some Greek myths, it's used as humor. Where one goddess does it to make the other goddess laugh to heal her. Um, but look at the title, Aphrodite, 
call it pigos. The peji, it's the pigos. It's of the fountain. That's what you're seeing. If you look at the, the, the end of the word there, P-Y-G-O-S, O-S, pigos, is P-E-G-E. -E. In the Bible, the fountain. There's your fountain right there. <laughs> the fountain Aphrodite. You know, and in some of it, they say it's Mary's well is first. When in Genesis, when the spring comes forth out of the abyss, they say that's the Virgin Mary's fountain. And, you know, so let, we'll explore one more picture before we bring Amunor. Cyprine. And you look up this word. You can type it in, and it says it means of ancient Greek, Cupris, and Ephesus of Aphrodite from the island of Cyprus. Or it means vaginal fluid. <laughs> of course it means vaginal fluid. Oh, wow. Yeah. So there's your water of life, your aqua vitae of Aphrodite. You know, um, that's yeah. wild. Great presentation, Dion. So let's uh, let's ask the good doctor to come join us here. And as he comes on, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell one more thing at, while you're here. It's the last page of the Bible. People will say it's the last verse, but the last page of the Bible, and it says that it's not the bridegroom that offers living water. It's the pneuma, the spirit, and the bride. That offers the water, but the bride's name is Nymph, a water daemona. But she doesn't give you water, she gives you the high door of Zoe, the sweat of Zoe. That's in the last page of the Bible. The living water comes from the bride, not the bridegroom, and it's the sweat of Zoe. That's kind of wild. That also it makes me immediately think of the Orphic um, myths where you have the nymphs in the waters and coming out of the mud, right? Uh, that, there's some there's some deep stuff there. What do you think, Ammon? Yeah, I think it's the bloom. First of all, great presentation, fantastic. Uh, right, type it up. Let's send it off to a journal. Um, <laughs> and no, fantastic work. And uh, I loved your, you know, Anasara. <laughs> your you're going to expose us. You, you mean they got together and lifted up their, yeah, it's a thesmophoric thing. You lift up your garments and you expose your genitalia. It's a religious thing. Didn't you guys use that? <laughs> right? Um, yeah, love that. And I love Calipiginous Aphrodite. She, that's actually a title they use for her, using your pegae root. They use that. Um, she of the beautiful... Pegue, you know, um, yeah, it's it's uh, delightful. It's baked into the cult and part of the culture. Beautiful job. I was um, looking at Balbo too that you were talking about, right? Balbo, very important people. You gotta understand what that whole business is about. And the skene, my God, you you brought it right to the skene, right to the place where they're gonna be possessed right where is that famous spot it's a gland right yeah yeah but if we're going to take communion from her then we're going to need we're going to need that um transformation that place of transformation yeah it's lovely isn't it lots uh was there a hermaphrodite in there somewhere too there should have been right <laughs> do we what is this? Does all of this right involve a hermaphrodite somewhere? Well, cut, Jesus cut. becomes kind of a hermaphrodite, does he not, when he receives the wound on his side that becomes a a, a vagina? Like, <laughs> I, think it, I think it's even deeper than that. Now, I'll throw this out there, and you tell me what you think. We'll bat it around. Um, why is his mother the the Holy Virgin? By the way, they say the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Is the only unforgivable blasphemy, right? But this is the same entity that got together with a overshadowed a twelve year, uh, you know, overshadowed a twelve year old girl in order to create a son of God. So um, the the fact that you guys are in that neighborhood with the Virgin, you're hitting all the you know, those are the images that we I d 
idolaters are going to be able to pick up on. Because, you know, we make big statues of virgins, worship them, right? And by worship them, you know what I mean. Um, we venerate. We do honor to that. You talked about urine tonight, too. You talk, you're talking about urine. I got to tell you, I've read some Greek physicians talk about, oh, the first time I read this, it made me a little bit queasy. But, um, you know, somebody comes in and they've got a problem and they'll pee. And you'll drink that pee. You, you won't drink it. You'll, you know, take a sip, let it roll around your mouth. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to pick up hints from the urine that'll indicate, you know, um, whether or not this person's humors are in adjustment. You know, you're, you're checking the fluids. Um, so there's a really intense, up close, you know, tasting is not typically a part of modern physicians work but um in antiquity it was so the whole urine thing they use urine to diagnose it's just really weird when i first started reading these i was like how the how do you come to those conclusions right and the funny thing is it works practically so they're using this as a as a you know pretty openly as a way to um as a way to diagnose so the this it's not much of a stretch to go to the to your magus right and he's what is he showing you? he's showing you the witches um ejaculating in the face of of um a man who's been paralyzed right he's giving you the very same images and they say when he gets up he smells like a smells like a brothel right it's not urine that he's using right so and the the water of life that you're talking about coming right out of that skene yes what happens when you make when you make that vessel that cup of god right because that's what those oracles are they're the cup of god nobody ever no nobody ever questions it they're like well, that's kind of a weird way to refer to yourself. No, it's not. Not if you're drinking from the ambrosia that's inside of the cup, right? It's right. not. It's not odd at all. And I keep thinking about like you know, um, Aphrodite is the foam of Uranus when he has his when he's castrated by Kronos. And then you also you brought this up numerous times, but the oldest statues of Aphrodite, she has a penis, right? And you're asking where the hermaphrodite comes in. I think it comes in right there. It's, it's with that, with that Afro, with her, oh, Aphrodite herself, you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't think that you can turn away from Aphrodite's penis. Um, do you really understand Urania? If you don't understand that she is um, defue, and what is that? It means she's both, right? She's She has both natures. And you're going to be like, no, they didn't say this about Aphrodite. Yes, and they even depicted. They depicted her that way. As a matter of fact, surprise, surprise, we're talking about the Thesmophoria, right? And these events that happened with Balbo and the whole exposure of herself, right? Um, guess what they, the Orphics say about Demeter? She is that dual natured entity she has both right you can't get by with with being either too feminine or too masculine with her because she's got both both worlds wrapped up into one so what do you do you know there's a practice there's a practice of converting the goddess and what do you do you cut off the testicles that's why they call them the theetokoi those who produce the goddess right jesus may have been born with them but what happened yeah, he gave them up. yeah. yeah. <laughs> right? this, this is the kind of thing they're doing in the temple right has everything to do with virgin birth everything to do with virgin birth and we think of the we think of the fairy tale Right, and God looked at me, oh, woo, and then boom, and, woo, and it's the perfect, ah, and it doesn't fit any historical context whatsoever. Um, so here's your historical context. Guess what? The virgins, they're doing this. It's part of the no, practice. 
This is right. such a common theme. Like um, I just read in a in an episode with my friend Graham on another show, we read the Oristia. And the whole point of the Oristia is that Athena is this dual nature. She is the combination of the male, the female, the Apollo and the Dionysus so that she can pass that fair judgment and bring justice. You have to balance these two natures and that's what leads to democracy. She is that gynomorph, um, and she is that one that carries the, it's, it's only her, the virgin, right? And again, we're talking about the virgin. It's only her that emerges from the mind of Zeus that scares every other divinity, that causes every other divinity to quake is how it's expressed. Right? Nobody does that. Mars doesn't do that, and Aphrodite doesn't, do nobody does it. It's only that virgin that appearance of that virgin is a thing of pure horror. I mean, she is the only one, right? I mean, she, what does she have Tack, tacked on her aegis? It's the head of that priestess that turns you to stone, right? If you want, there's a reason that when Hephaestus was, you know, it's one thing to be around the virgin, right? It's one thing to be around her. <laughs> You, um, you know she's the virgin, and she's not to be violated. That's, you know, if you are a um, pious follower of the gods, that's the, you know, you respect virginity, you respect virginity. But when Hephaestus is around her, right, that force that is Hephaestus, that Orphic Hephaestus, the, the, the bridge of the technology, Right to bring us the arts that is always attracted to the virgin, and is depicted as ejaculating. Right, he can't control himself. He she brings out his seed. Well, what does she do? She collects his seed, right, and she raises his seed. And his seed is that primordial king, that prophet king. Wait, what? Yeah. The prophet king, you know who I'm talking about. The prophet king who is half serpent, right? Serpent from the waist down, they called it. It's some kind of phrase. that e Even the viper virgin priestess, she's said to be serpent from the waist down. So um, is, it, is that kind of a reference to what they're doing with the venoms and how they're administering it? Because it's got to be something different um, taking in uh, ejaculate um, in one's eyes and mouth and then having a priestess put it onto a, um, a dildo, which, by the way, I noticed that you mentioned the olispos, right? Um, yeah, um, calling it just a straight-up bow bone, right? Why would they do that? The olispos is a dildo. It's a dildo, right? Um, why would they call it bow bone? They're calling it after the one who is exposing, who's exposing herself, right? These are all, right, people have to realize nobody sat down and thought this stuff up. This is all coming from ritual. It's coming from medicine. It's coming from, from religion. So what is the association then between Balbo's exposure and the creation of a of a dildo. Um, why are 20,000 what Roman women, or however many there were, thousands, why are there thousands of Roman women meeting every year in what appears to be a gigantic um, orgy where well, it's just women, women only. They just come and women from the community and part of it is Part of it is producing what is called the bonadea. Can, can you produce the bonadea? Have you been or have you ever caused somebody to be possessed by the Bonadea? That's the good goddess. Have you ever been there? Well, they're doing it. They're doing it. So when Augustine comes along and says, don't sit on that priapus, those sick, disgusting pagans, right? Sitting on their priapus in a wedding. They're having a, the nymph, the bride. You guys are talking about the bride. Did you know it was tradition for her to sit? On a priapus? Wait, with all of us watching? Yep. Did you know it was customary the first night 
for her to offer her buttocks instead of her vagina. Yes, yes. And the husband couldn't, couldn't say anything about it, right? He, he had no choice. But they're treating the buttocks a lot different, too. They're treating, the, you know, the whole idea that we have a sodomy, sodomy. Um, that's, uh, that's when you're living in a society that's used to getting, you know, how do you give your child, how do you, um, how do you give your child the opium that it needs to, um, to go to sleep and for its intestines to settle down and for it to stop having pain? You know, your infant. Your newborn, how do you get it when it's got these problems? How do you get it slowed down, it's digested? You give them opium. You give them opium. And how do you think you give them that opium? You don't, you don't nurse it to them. You, don't, you administer it to them anally, right? It's, it's a, it's a, you, ta you take the trojos or trojiscoi that Dion was talking about, right? And you use those rectally. Um, it's, not, it's like they're, they're viewing... The rectum is more of a transit area than, than um, the holy seal that we have put upon the anus, right? No, who would? Oh, are you kidding? You mean she had the option to offer her anus? Yeah, because you know what? The other area is, you know, it may be more scary, right? It may be, I don't know, it may be more difficult, right? Where's Hymen? Hymen, Hymenaeus, right? These people are right in there. You know, they worshiped Hymenaeus, right? You guys mentioned him. This wedding thing, the whole Eleusinian mysteries is about bringing back that nymph that, um, who went off to hell to marry um, Hades, right? So, yeah, love it. Okay, I'll stop. Yeah. Oh, no, you're, you're filling in a lot of the story. There's so much to unpack here. People think we're making this up. Like you said, there's no, we're not making this up. This symbology, these rituals and theosexual rituals that go back thousands of years. And they've made it into art, into literature, into music, into film, into everything. It's in our subconscious. And they were the enemy, right? They were the enemy when... Um, with the establishment of the darkness that was Christianity, the kind of it's as Western civilization's um, light was withdrawn and Christianity um, pushed, um, pushed us through what used to be called dark ages. Um, as, as all of this happened, um, the specific enemy or the antagonist that we had to take out in Christian society were these mystery religions that are involving sexuality, um, drugs, Right, they all, all the drugs right away. If you can regulate in the transition the of genders, right? <laughs> right, and this whole the whole definition. I mean, this is when you start seeing real what we call homosexuality. That is, it's defined. People define it, right? It's not. It starts with sodomy, right? The Romans and Greeks didn't do this, right? The Romans and Greeks didn't have to come up with a name for this because it was just coitus to them, right? It's coitus. So um, for the, when the Christians when the Christians targeted Aphrodite and when they targeted um, the great mother and they brought down all of those gods, they brought down the institutions that perpetuated the purges that those cults were performing for the advantage of society. And, yeah, and the early the early Christians are explicit about this. I always think of that quote by um, uh, the theologian Orisius: "All that is evil is pagan." It's fourth century, you know. <laughs> it's like, go ahead. Oh, you know what I was gonna say? It's ironic that the core of the Christian ritual now is a fluid sexual communion. You know, some would say it's just symbolic, but you go drink somebody's blood and you eat of their body, and a lot of touching going on, and you know, uh, weird takes on, on sexuality. It's like the mystery's there. It's just mixed up, convoluted, because they couldn't sanitize all of it, you know? Yeah, or they would have had to make up something new, and Christianity's not new. It's built upon a foundation of older mystery religions. So, yeah, totally, totally.
And, you know, we look at all of the things that the Christians vilify, right? They vilify sexuality, homosexuality, trans people, women, possession. Uh, the god Pan becomes the becomes Satan, right? These are all at the heart of the mystery and are the most important part of the ancient pagan mystery cults. All of them, this is the central stuff. So what did they vilify? That which was essential, you know? That's why we call ourselves Satanists here. <laughs> It's Qu one question thing. for you, Armin. Go ahead. About uh, how I pronounce the name. Is it P Patho, Pytho, Hermes' wife? Yeah, Patho. You got it. You nailed Patho? it. Patho. Okay. Yeah, persuasion. You got she that steals, persuasion. She steals through a different way. If Hermes just will steal you, she steals through seduction, through persuasion. Because she's involved with a lot of uh, episodes. You know, and I never heard of her. You know, today we're trying to pull out the more esoteric uh, gods and goddesses because they have functions with body fluids and body parts. How are you going to how are you going to get ready um, without that persuasion? Right. The, the act of intercourse that the physical thing that leads to that orgasmon, that thing that you the thing that you do with your psyche. Right. Um that whole act um they know them this can be pushed forward it can be augmented it can be assisted it's a part of physiology we can we can incorporate it um just like the singing right i was talking with somebody about well um what do you do with the fact that there's the singing that's involved in these rights as well you're talking about drug rights i get it you get it we all get it we've made her she can now ejaculate that which brings us to death and life again, where we see her as the queen that she is, right? Hail Satan. That's the kind of, okay, drugs, I get it, but there's an element of singing that they say is even more important for the person who is undergoing the initiation. Now, on top of that, what do you do with the sexual element? Right now, you've got another element. You've got a person who's been put into a state. They still have an erection because they have satyriasis from the drugs, the aphrodisiacs you're giving them. They're entering a death state, and you are doing things to them to put them into a sexual state of orgasm while you're singing in their ear. And the combination, the drugs that they're using are a combination of those that make you psychotic those that make you horny, those that make you terrified, and those that um, bring a loving embrace, that bring persuasion, that bring that power. So it, it's, a, it's a combination that if you don't have somebody, an artist who knows how to put that all together, you know, much less imagine the, the woman who invented that, who was able to devise this process, who was able to make the water of life. What would we call her? Well, in antiquity, we called her Skutha and we called her um, um, Christamana, the one who's been Christed, right? Oh, my God. Um, do you see it's there? Maybe it's just... Um, maybe it's just uh, a matter of mental health. In in your searches for the material today, as you're looking at at this water of life, um, did you did you did you did either of you think for a minute? Isn't this really just kind of mental health that that's going on? A hundred percent. Go ahead, Dion. I wanted to mention Hymenaeus and Hymen again because you said a form of singing. There's a form of singing that deals with hymen. It's a form of, of chorals. Now, everything that's been going on today, imagine there was a group of women on the sidelines singing at the tabernacle, at the scenes, at the skeins Ted, at the urology visit in ancient Egypt, at every single ceremony where it's at the, the stealing of the brides, at the what's called the wedding chamber or the nuptial chamber in Valentinian Christianity. There's a whole thing that deals with the Valentinian uh, bridal chamber. But there is singing taking place at every junction of this. Now, with Hyman, it's a form of singing. 
not only is it the, the god of marriage, and the hymen is also the seal on the vagina that we know people talk about being broken. If it's, Is it intactus? You know, so there's a lot of symbology on different levels going on here. And I think that's why in Christianity it strikes us as odd a little bit, but not them so much originally because that marital connection was there. You're, you're bringing the two together. And so um, that him, Hymen O Hymenaeus, it's a, it's a central formation of the mystery. Um, so, okay. Yeah. So modern Catholicism talk about the mystery of marriage and whatnot, right? Because that ultimately is hooked back to an act that we're performing within a um, ritual in order to kick ourselves into death and back in order to be born again. Isn't that funny? What developed from it is nothing like it, right? It preserves, like you're saying, Dion, that core, those core images it preserves. And I'm sure, I hate to go to this kind of a dark place, but I'm sure um, that there's- Dark Harbor? Dark Harbor? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Dark Harbor, yeah. I'm sure that there's something in the priest who molests the kid. I'm sure there's some sort of variation of justifying um, your act as some kind of, you know, you're good in doing it. There's some kind of flip, and that has got to appeal to what it, what was the original trigger of the people involved from this. Because remember, you're collecting um, fluids from living human beings that are given certain status, right? And you can't violate the virgins, right? That's just the way it is. As a matter of fact, the pagans claim that the Christians would rape their children in order that they could not become oracular. So, you know, it's kind of like, uh, okay, sex is part of the main, is part of the mainstream here. And look at, where's the sex in modern Christianity? There's no sex. I, I'm sorry. I've been to churches. I've been to Baptist services. I've preached at them, right? Um, there's no element of sex. It's been banished from, from the process. That's why they can't, that's why they can't deal with Snappy, right? That's why they can't deal with you, Snappy. You've been banished. Your type has been banished from, but they're no longer into the transformations. They're no longer into it, which is, which is a shame because there's a lot of good medicine. And like I was saying before, mental health in it's, all it wrapped up in all of that. It's also it's so essential to everything. Like when I was looking into these Dionysian rites, even the ones that predate the theater, right? It's all about how do you bring Demeter back her daughter? How do you bring back the core? You have to sing the phallic songs. What is the phallic song? You got to make the virgin sing. Okay, how do you make the virgin sing, right? They're, what do you think they're talking about with the skein and all this stuff? They're talking about performing oral sex on women. And they're talking about making her orgasm and sing out, cry out her song. This is a fertility rite. And by making her sing, you literally make the plants grow. Like this is so essential to everything. And it's incredible that um, all of that is wrapped up in the language and it'll come out in the language and people tell, tell me all the time. I can't, I can't believe you said that. I thought it was crazy, but I looked and here's a text that says it. And yeah, no, let's like Dion said, we, we got no reason to make shit up. Right. I'm not, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that um, on your show. We're not, um, we're not, there's, we're not going to be dishonest with people. Right. So yeah, I'm not selling anything. I don't want you to buy my t-shirt with it. You know, this is just to get the information out there, right? And and when people begin to see it, all of a sudden there's a percolation and um, eyes are opened. And all of a sudden when the reality strikes you, you re it's like, I don't know, it's the most it's the most harmful and yet healing thing you can possibly do. When you have to look into that mirror, when you look in that mirror and you see Jesus there, you know, and this is Jesus and you see him for who he is and you see him involved with all these titles. It should have been enough people that he had all of these Orphic mystery titles, right? 
here, I'm going to introduce one. Just I'm going to give it away because I was going to give it on Wednesday, but I'm going to give it away. I just want to say that when we honor um, the great mother, when we honor Demeter, right, Dameter, um, when we honor her, um, we do so because she is the only begotten. <laughs> you mean she's the only begotten Savior? Yeah, she is. She is. That guy you hung on the cross? Yeah, you might want to look at his genitalia a little bit more closely. Yeah, you, you, um, it's a part of the biology. It was the biology of the right, right? Why is it so lucky that we get hermaphrodites? Well, right? it also blows my mind. Like, we don't look at all these other cultures, and we don't think, like, why would the Christians be just taking and creating something new wholesale? Like, if we look... The Greek, you still have some of this stuff with the with the with the trans people. But if you go back even further to summer, they're they're absolutely everywhere. You have men who go home and are men at home, but then work as priestesses. So they have a dual gender in their daily lives. Then you have those people who transition and become the other sex, either the guards who are masculine guards but are born as or were originally women who become these male guards or you have these priestesses who were men who transitioned into men the oldest poem we have written by anyone by uh, the priestess endu enduasa i believe i can't pronounce her name sorry but the oldest written attributed poem thanks the great goddess inanna for giving us the power to transition genders to make men women and to make women men like, and they even had third gender people who were in between. Like, this, this, this is as old as written word. Like, come on. And it's venerated. It's not just, it's not just a authority thing that it's old. They also venerated this process. The wisest prophets or the ones that inevitably something happens and they have to experience life as a woman, right? And so they go through this transformation into a woman just take tiresias right you know he's the he's the the ideal prophet he's the, the ideal greatest prophet, magus right why because he's been both and he has the best judgment he's been both right he's been through those those places even heracles everybody loves heracles and they're like oh this is the man cult, right? This is oh yeah he's just a warrior and they think right right <laughs> And they don't realize that, um, yeah. What about his dress, right? <laughs> this is the man cult, but you know that he likes to put on the dress um, when he's with the queen, right? And that's part of the transformation, right? Achilles, people don't realize. Do you raised know as a woman. He's raised as a girl in a school for priestesses, not just any school. It's a school for priestesses. It's got the highest ranking um girls in the in the area there in the school one of them that he has a relationship with um ends up being there's a connection with her in medea and we know that achilles marries medea in the underworld marries her in the underworld and, yeah and you think yeah you think why achilles why is that why is that personal isn't that um because he is that burned off son of god he is that, just like she is the Magdal, he is that one who has had his immortality burned off. He must have only one. He has to have the prime, the one who started the right, right? Remember the contest too? <laughs> Everything about the beauty and Cretans are all liars. That's all that generation before, late Bronze Age generation before the events of the Iliad. It's setting up everything in the Iliad. And it is all based on um, this cult use of drugs in the empire, the Bacchic empire that it created. I was just talking this morning with somebody about um, um, Circe because the question was, it, this can go bad, right? You can have somebody who knows how to master these drugs who can really do something bad to a person under the influence. And I said, what do you think? the whole late bronze age was about just look at cersei right she's got a whole pin of men 
to yeah. to have intercourse with, to sodomize, to beat up, to beat with a stick, right? She and her ladies. And how did they get there? She gave them drugs, right? Same thing with Queen Semiramis. She yeah. said to have all of those men who who willfully, they willfully engage with her. They cut off their testicles and, and become her sex slaves. And this is very explicit. And we also know like in the myths, when you're talking about the family of Helios, right? Hecate is considered this horrible, horrible person who kills anyone who lands on her lands. And she teaches those rights to Circe. What makes Medea... The savior is that she gives up the human sacrifice and makes it about life affirmation. She teaches people the medicine. That's why she is the medwa, right? Hospitals, man. They're putting temples to her up. And they've got them even in Italy, right? Hospitals, right? This is where she healed this people. Yeah. So there's a transition. But you know that potential was always there in that technology, for these people who are developing these rights, the things that we're calling rights now, right? The, the process. Imagine if I could heal myself by enrolling in a program at a temple where they were going to take me to a place you'd think it wouldn't be. a. It's not like rehab. Take this person to rehab and bombard them with all good, positive, reinforced. No, it's the exact opposite. You're going to hit this person with psychotic drugs, drugs that make them psychotic and horny, drugs that make them want to eat human flesh. You would think this is not a good place to be, right? This is not. That's the point. That's the point of why they're tying them up to put them through the process. Because when you get to the other side, it's a purge. It gets rid of that. You want to stop being depressed? You want to stop thinking about what's compelling you what your obsessed compulsions are um try a weekend at a place where you're going to enter a a state of your being that you didn't know was there you right and you you're going to get there through a a person who's been transformed into this divine or semi-divine entity this this magdalian prophet yeah, love it. Oh God, I love it. Nobody understands what Magdal's doing there. Nobody, right? Nobody gets it. She's even carrying around the expensive drugs. Nobody, nobody gets it because we don't want to see the sexuality. But when we say Jesus was arrested in the public park at 4 a.m. with a naked boy, we, you know, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to start getting around that. Um, yeah. Oh God, beautiful well, presentation. To, to well, that, that begs the question that. Was Jesus collecting water of life at 4 a.m. in a public park? Was he? What was he doing with the boy? Because, see, if you're on Heracles' side, they can convert it to where that kid is producing it. That kid is the cup, the Ganymede, right? You're drinking right out of the kid. Nobody the has a problem. Fish, hmm? The fountain. And where does the fountain come from? Yeah. Yeah. The, the piggy. Bath. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but we also got to remember, right? The the main ads. What do they do to Orpheus? Orpheus, who who abandons after he fails to sing the song to bring back his deceased wife. There, um, he go. He he takes up the boys. He takes up young men, and he gets punished. This is explicit in the fragments. And the main ads rip him apart. They throw his head down the river, and they install it on the Isle of Lesbos to become a totem of prophecy, you know? <laughs> That's what happens to those who practice the rites on children. Is that where it entered? I forgot that it went to Lesbos. I remember it went, it went to Lesbos. I was just looking this up because Perot was asking me about it because I had said he had mentioned something about these mounds and the removing of heads. This is constant theme we see where these, these men have their heads removed and turned into these prophetic devices or they become the burial place of mounds that then birth great cities. It's like um, when you look at the story of Branwen in the Welsh, her brother Bran is this great giant. And when he dies, right at the end of the story, Branwen cuts his head off, turns it into a prophetic totem, buries it in a mound, and that becomes the seed of London. <laughs> That sounds like borrowed custom to me. It sounds like something coming over in the myth, kicking over 
into the next society or is it that or is it is it contamination or is it some kind of natural um you know image some kind of quantum image that keeps coming up right this um when you get to the bottom of that drinking cup and you see the face you wonder you're like why the hell were the were the athenians this weird that their special drinking cups had pictured in the bottom of them this face and it's not like a nice face it's a face with fangs and a giant tongue eh, sticking out of it right why where do you want to where have you been that you want that to be the image when you have consumed your your mixed drink and by the way if you put a little bit of hellebore right a little bit of hellebore for a little downward purge along uh, along with some you know just a sprinkle of henbane and one of these things not too much you'll kill yourself right but if you do that you're well on your way to when that face pops up it makes a lot more sense it's uh it's a beauty that you haven't seen you haven't been born again you don't know what you're talking about right um once you get there yeah um and the you know the problem is we need her we need her jesus wasn't bringing himself in this world for any other reason but in order to save it right especially the hamartoloi those um those prostitutes right <laughs> right prostitutes do you understand he's like i'm not handling the money <laughs> it's the kid over there the one that turned me in right oh god he was the only witness by the way judas he was the only witness that they would have taken uh, as credible, right? Because he was the accountant. He was the one who was making sure that all the money was counted, right? Clever kid, man. Clever kid. Yeah, he and Matt, you know, Matt hung around the other. You want to know why Matt hung around the tax collectors? Yeah, well, one of the disciples ends up getting them all in the door. I don't know if anybody noticed that. But when Jesus goes in, guess what? That girl prostitute who's watching the front door, right? She who keeps that area, she lets them in only because that kid knows the high priest. Why? Because they go fishing together. That's right. that's actually the statement. They go <laughs> fishing. To catch young boys, right? Read the secret gospel of Mark, people. Read the gospel of Judas, where Judas himself accuses Jesus of molestation. Okay, we're not making this stuff up. <laughs> I'll, make you, I'll make you fishers of men i'll make you fishers of men you stick with me you know what i mean but can you blame him he's right in the middle of that and there's people who were doing it before him and there's people that were doing it after him and not only that but he got set up man they were giving him drugs from the time that he was born you don't think you don't think mary who was raised in the temple to eat from the hands of angels you don't think she was using the drugs that the Magi gave him on Jesus? Wake well, up. I want to know what's going on with Mary, Mary Salome, and John and Jesus. Because there's something, there is something lost in translation that's been broken down here. Because you got this woman, this powerful woman in the temple who's not mentioned in the Bible, right? But she's mentioned in all of the other history books, who's said to be the daughter of Herod. And then she has John killed. John and takes his head, right? As <laughs> and then all of a sudden Jesus is the prophet. What is where's Mary in all of this? Are they the same person? What's going on? There's all this conflation of women, too, right? We know that Martha is a later addition because we can go back to the original text and we can see where Mar Martha gets added in. And now you have this mysterious woman called Mary Salome. What if they're all one woman? Mary, Martha, and how and old are Salome. they? How how old are they, Snappy? How old are Mary and Martha, the brother and sister? Uh, I mean, the the sisters of uh, Lazarus, right? Who's getting on his scale, and he's going into death and coming out. Um, they appear to be children, right? Um, so, as a matter of fact, there's one uh, um, that that um, pay, that theological paper was arguing that based on. The fact that both Mary and Martha are unmarried and they both talk to Jesus as if he's a senior, he's he's senior to them, and they have kind of kid-like comments to him, right? And this is he's hanging around their rich cemetery, man. This is 
this is some bad stuff. There's a reason the purple is, I mean, just think, you guys have talked about it a ton. The purple, purple traffic in antiquity, right? What originally compelled the Phoenicians into a tr vast trading empire. What, um, what is the level of involvement at this point with Jesus and the children that he is turning into disciples? You know, what is the, um, why is it that Paul is funded? Right. If you were to set this up as a RICO operate sting, you know, prosecution, um, you'd be able to identify who profited over time. And Paul the Apostle somehow ends up profiting through the purple trade. It's it's like how how are these people who are the drug connection, right? When you see Lydia, she works in the purple. And, oh, she had a thing set up her cloth and dyed her cloth. It was an operation. She's a drug dealer. She's a ass kicking drug dealer who is funding people like Paul. Where's who, she getting all that money? Where are these kids yeah. getting all this money? <laughs> right. yeah. Do you fed how many thousand people? Now look, there's uh, those of you who believe in the fairy tale that one fish can turn into two with the wave of a magic wand. Right. But what do the facts show? The facts show that Jesus Christ was feeding groups of thousands of people, thousands of people. This is the man who's walking around with a box of gold from birth. Right. This is the man who they won't tear apart his clothing because it's too goddamn valuable. Excuse me. I'm too cursy. I don't want to get you in trouble. It's too valuable. Right. What? Uh, um, I thought this was the humble, the Mr. Blessed of the meek. Yeah, blessed of the meek all the way to the giving Judas the purple and a little piece of bread and saying, go, suckhead, do what you're going to do. Right? <laughs> right? It's just you get two different. There's two different Jesuses. And the one in the Bible is not the one um, that everybody's been introduced to. It's like a sanitized sanitized undrugified unsexualized um jesus christ yeah um yeah Whew, i'll stop but yeah we got to wind down because we can't take up too much of your time you have students today so dion do you have any final comments for ammon um well just for everybody like subscribe share leave some comments go out there and get you some water of life because you know you're thirsty you know whatever that means to you and I'll leave it at that. Ammon's last show is on Wednesday. It is not to be missed. It's not to be missed. The end of Lady Babylon. What are we expecting, Ammon? Besides, of course, having our jury trial. Yeah, it's going to be a flip in the end to show you the opposite of what you thought was coming. So I'll just leave it at that. I'll just leave it at that. And I'm, uh, I just want to say thank you to your audience, Snappy, and to mine. Um, and the overlaps that are there. I want those people to know how much I've appreciated and um, their support um, mentally, right? Their mental support. People don't send me money um, um, unless they're learning Greek in dojo. And it's, you know, it's, it's uh, legitimate. Um, but the, your audience, Snappy, my audience, they have been kind enough to give me their attention. And to me, that is, you know, um, that's everything. So thank you, people, for for paying attention. It's a it's a, a privilege to be able to be um, to be with you. So thank you, and thank you, Ammon, for sharing with us all your knowledge and all your time. And for those of you who are screaming in the background, this is far from the end. Ammon will talk more about this on the day, but we have Omnia coming which is the Academy. So there's always going to be new stuff. This was always just intended. You told me at the beginning, you had intended to write a book and rather than write a book, cause no one reads, you wanted to bring it to the audience directly for free. And that's what you did. And that's what you set out to do. And people are seeing the value and that's where Omnia is coming from. Um, and I'll tell people more about Omnia, but um, look, it's a mission, a sacred mission that we all have, and that's to bring back the museum, right? And there cannot be, we, we cannot compromise. We must always hold that temple of the muse to be sacred. And that's what you guys are, are, are both doing. So yeah. thank, thank you for letting me be a part of that. 
Well, thank you everyone so much for joining. Like and subscribe. We have all our links below. You can subscribe to Ammon at Lady Babylon 666. And we will see you guys next week for our Saturnalia party. Ammon will be joining us as well as tons of people from the Discord and from the community. We're going to be drinking, getting married, being lewd. And we're also going to be crowning a princeps. And that could be one of you. The only people who can't be princep are Dion and I. Everyone else, we're gonna be rolling the sacred die and whoever the muse chooses gets to boss us around. So <laughs> it's gonna be fun. It's gonna be oh, a blast. It's gonna be fun. If you're at home watching, be prepared, have a party with us. You know, it, it'll be around the world, simultaneous party, have fun. Exactly, get on your thrones, people. You all know what that means by now. So <laughs> thank you again. Peace, love, hail Satan. All right.